Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to season one, episode eight of Engineering Advice You Didn't Ask For. Today, topic of our discussion is acing the technical interview. We are going to go into both breadth and depth of topics that cover a technical interview. But before we start, let's do a quick round table and introduce ourselves. My name is Keyur. I work at a company called Point Click Care. It's a healthcare company based out of Toronto, Canada. Mitra? Hey, I'm Mitra. I am a senior engineering manager and in the past I've been a software engineer and a startup founder. I'll move it to Vic. Hi, hey, I'm Vic. I'm a staff engineer at Eventbrite. I've previously been a principal engineer, engineering manager, director of engineering, and I also run a few SaaS products. Tiago? Hey folks, my name is Tiago. I'm currently a director of engineering at Nubank, and before that I was at Apple, and before that at American Express. At the moment, I'm building a course on Gun Road about how to ace the technical interview or the thing interview as an engineering manager. Louis? Hello, I'm Louis. I've worked at big companies and fast-moving startups. Thank you, everyone. So what is the technical interview? Today, we are getting into specifics for what that would look like for a senior or a staff engineer or a principal engineer who, who wants to pursue the individual contributor path and also for a senior manager and for somebody that wants to pursue the people management path. But I just wanted to start off by picking on individuals on what their recent experiences has been like. Pre-COVID times, companies used to fly you out and depending on, on how deep their pockets were, business class, executive class, all expenses paid for a week maybe. And then four days of interview, one day you do some sightseeing depending on where the company is based out of and they fly you back. So whether you get the job or not, at the end of the day, you're still satisfied with the, the flight, the meals, the, the hospitality, and it's memorable either way, right? If you get it, obviously that's a feather in your cap. If you don't, it's still an executive flight to and back that you got to experience. Obviously, things changed with COVID. They've all been Zoom interviews or Teams interviews or, or what have you. And durations have significantly reduced as well. They're usually more back-to-back, -back, fewer number of days. I think part of that is also because the job market is so hot and candidates have multiple offers, so they want to optimize on the time. So maybe let's start with what a recent interview experience was for you and what the duration was as well. So from starting first conversation with HR to offer date, yay or nay, how long that process was, just to, to gauge a sense of comparison. Tiago, do you want to start us off? Hello, everyone. Louis here with a quick word about a product that a friend of ours recently launched. Zane has recently launched insider advice on how you can pass the FANG interview. Of course, this is very related to our episode tonight. Zane didn't pay us to promote this product or anything, but we we all bought it and we all love it. And Zane is a friend of the show, of course. We, we met him in the Small Bets community. I've already gone through the entire course and, and it's fantastic. And he, like he says, insider information, he's passed multiple FANG interviews already. And the course is just basically 20 bucks. And I think you're going to get your money's worth listening to Zane's advice and all of this. He has some things that are not so obvious. Of course, he goes through his journey and, and, and some of that. He has wisdom that is absolutely not conventional, such as jotting down your stories, leaning into annual reviews for stories to pass the interview, and some tips and tricks on how you could perform much better in these types of interviews. Anyway, we hope you check it out. We'll have a link in the show notes, but basically the course is called Insider Advice on how to pass the FANG interview. Zane, you could find him on Twitter and he is a Zane at Zane RZV on Twitter. And again, the course is Insider Advice on how you could pass the FANG interview. And we highly recommend it. Basically, I watched the whole thing. He's not paying me or anything, but I really um, believe it's a good course and it's very much related to our content tonight. Thank you. And back to our regular scheduled programming. Tiago. Perfect. So in my case, I did interview for three out of the, the things. I'm not going to mention the apes to not get in trouble. But I would say the process for two of them, the process started in November, probably late October 2020. And I had the offers in February. But the, the one thing that is important to mention was that even though I got contacted by the recruiters late October, 
I scheduled my interviews to mid December and one of them for actually mid January. So that's why it took so long. And there are some of the things that is the interview with the hiring manager first to figure out where you're going to land and maybe multiple discussions at the beginning. And for some of the things you have the, the team matching at the end. So that's why it takes additional couple of weeks to figure out the either the matching at the beginning or the matching at the end. But the core, I would say, is usually between five to six interviews, but you don't consider the screening interview with the recruiter. So this initial call, the recruiter to align expectations and maybe the, the famous questions, what kind of salary are you talking about? All those, you're probably gonna get like at the beginning and then you're gonna schedule the on-site day. Or in some cases, if it is your first time, a lot of those are going to schedule like a technical interview before you go to the loop, right? As they say. And some of them might even schedule two uh, because the first one was not strong enough. So that was actually my experience. Out of the three things, one, because I had interviewed five years before and had been rejected, I already skipped the TV interview because I got close enough that they, they can, okay, we, we don't need to assess the technical side. So I went straight to the own side for. The other one, I had a lot of conversations with like VPs, directors, and maybe like close to seven conversations before I even go to the technical route. So they're really like trying to see the culture side before. And for one of them, I actually had two technical screenings, technical interviews with potential peers of mine or people at the same level, assessing a mix of behavior and system design to then do the, the loop. And I believe in all cases, my loop was split in two days because I did during the pandemic, right? Like late 2020, beginning of 2021. So my experience interview has been fully remote, especially as a manager. I never interviewed as a manager in an on-site traditional thing. My, my previous interview was more when I was an engineer. So yeah, cycle time around three months, but I would say maybe two to three weeks. And in one of the, the things, I actually had the team matching process taking an additional three weeks because it is actually a really, it is a really hard step because it's not only you have to like the particular business unit or the particular product you're joining, they also have to like you and you have to do the ranking on both sides. So it's okay, you get three pitches, they get three candidates, and then you rank, you rank from top to bottom, they rank from top to bottom. And if you're not at the same level, then you get this card and you have to pick it up other hiring managers that might want you. So it keeps going. And I actually have a friend that for his case took a year for the team matching process. And because he was also super picky. So I think that's another, another card yet, but that's it. Maybe we can get into specifics. There was a few interesting points that Thiago uh, brought up. One was the interview with the peers and maybe especially for engineering manager positions, should you ask, to interview, and I say interview in quotes, it could be an informal chat with somebody on the team that you will be managing. I, I don't know if that's common practice or if that's encouraged or, or discouraged. So that again, both the team gets to know you, you get to ask questions around specifics around what they enjoy, what they dislike, and, and you get a feel for fit as well. So uh, again, I don't know if anyone here has used that approach for both okay. peers and the team. I can just quickly answer that. But out of the three things that I interviewed for, only one of them, I actually met some of the potential direct reports. Out of the others, I only met either the hiring manager or both the hiring manager or peers that were from other parts of the company that had nothing to do with, with the, my potential change. So that's actually the reality in most companies. You actually don't get to talk directly to your direct reports. Usually you have skip level of them being your interface. Louis? Yeah. So I, I saw the process play out at Walmart. I've seen it at other big companies. I saw it at Bank of America. We actually set up a process there. I think the process that we set up at Jet was probably one of the best I've ever seen for a couple of reasons. We saw that basically we were this fast moving startup trying to compete with Fang for hires. And one thing we saw is that when it took too long, 
we were very likely going to lose the candidate. So we put an SLA around the NTAN. We basically have to produce an offer in two weeks or produce a no. And so that, that actually ended up working really well for us. And I was very fortunate to watch the EVP of engineering design this with two other people that one guy had designed it in Amazon. We, we hired some great people at Jet. And then the other one had seen it at Google. And so they were like trying to pick out the best parts of that. And so ultimately we, we landed on this process whereby we have people that are tra trained in individual tracks. We literally had training for the engineers to go in, what types of questions are okay, what types of questions are not okay. And we had data structures and algorithms. We had system design, we had basic coding, and we had a bunch of behavioral stuff. And we would throttle those based on how senior or how junior someone is, but it was always about five on site from that list and always somebody that was trained in that track. I was trained in multiple tracks because I had to hire a lot of people, but that, that ended up working super well for us. Now, looking back with hindsight, I wish it wasn't so whiteboard heavy. The way I made some of my best hires, I actually didn't even rely on the whiteboard so much, but especially when you're trying to scale a process, it's very difficult. When you have to hire a few hundred engineers, you have a small team, you have to have a pipeline almost. And you have to get through that pipeline really fast and produce offers and all this other stuff. So I saw that whole thing play out and SLA helped us immensely. Mitra, you have something you want to add? Yeah, your description of the process just reminded me of a process we set up at an old, not old company, but one of my previous companies. Full transparency, I haven't interviewed as a senior or I don't think I interviewed senior or staff engineers at a big company because by the time I left Amazon, I was an SD1 or SDM1 and hiring SDE1s and 2s. But at Row, a previous startup I was at, it was a growth stage company. We're hiring a ton of people. And one of the biggest things I was part of is revamping the hiring process. So we did a lot of what we described and was done at Jet was um, breaking it down into tracks, uh, having engineers shadowed and trained on individual tracks. Some people would only do the active coding parts. Some people were trained on multiple parts. One thing I really appreciated and enjoyed was bringing in product managers or design members into one of the engineering interviews because it was a product-led organization. So you had a lot of cross-functional work that you would have to do. So that was super important for that. And another thing that I think every company has in some shape or form, but doesn't really pay attention to is the hiring manager phone screen at the beginning. This is ideally between the recruiter talk and then before your intense onsite. Some companies choose not to do them, but I've actually found they're great time savers for the company, but also great for the candidate to get to know the person they would actually work with and report to. At Row, we use the hiring manager phone screens, of course, to get to know each other, but also get some insight into how they think and do some high-level architecture problems and nothing to whiteboard, nothing to code, but really get a sense of how you think through problems, what kind of questions you would ask and dig deeper into just a line on a resume, really understand like how familiar they are with different things that they've worked on. Fair, go ahead. Those are great insights. Maybe we'll, we'll skip from acing the interviews to, to failing at interviews and some of our learnings from them. Because I, I think you, you learn as much from the ones that you didn't get on how to double down on your next one. So I'll call on Vic to maybe share some of his experiences and the ones that he didn't get into. Sure. I'm happy to go on this one. So I did recently, it was over a year ago, interview with a bunch of companies. I basically fired off my resume, you know, I optimized them and I applied to a bunch of different positions. I applied to Netflix and AWS and just all over the place. So my big feedback for all these places is that speed of interview process is a competitive advantage. There were places where the first recruiter reach out was in something like, let's say the end of January. And I was still in the process through no fault of mine, but everything was just moving as fast as possible on their side. I was still in the process at the beginning of April when I withdrew and three months, come on, you're not going to hold on to a candidate for three months. I stayed in one of these processes in Amazon's process for that long because every subsequent company that would reach out to me, I would say, oh, I'm deep in the interview process at Amazon. And they would say, oh, we'll let you skip all of our interviews and go right to the end. And I was like, wait, I could have done this the whole time. And uh, using 
one for leverage is always great. So that, but in terms of the other rejections, some of them were me rejecting them. Some of them, them rejecting me. It was just not a good fit. So other than the speed of interview process, there were some that were just, uh, they, they would give you take home tests instead of doing a whiteboard. I think people are starting to understand that not everyone is comfortable with doing a whiteboard test, but the take home tests are just differently bad because instead of reserving an hour long session for you to go do a whiteboard interview that you're uncomfortable with. Instead, you're taking home something that you're spending four or five hours on at the end of your day. And that's not good either. And then at the end of that, the company might reject you with no feedback. So that wasn't great. Other things, oh, this is pre-pandemic, but I did fly to a Facebook's headquarters and did a literal whiteboard interview. It was an entire room painted with whiteboard paints. So you're surrounded by whiteboards. It's pretty, it's, it's either torture or great, depending on how you look at it. But I flew to, I forget where Facebook is now. I flew there and did that interview because I got a free ticket to go visit my sister, basically. And Facebook paid for it. And that was good. Netflix was really quick, both in terms of when they rejected me and they told me why, which was unique among a lot of the different companies. And they really set out specific things. They told you exactly what they would do and that it would take X number of weeks and that they had the process down to a T. There were a few others like that. Stripe sent me a whole PDF of exactly what the interview was going to be. And you would think that big tech companies are really organized with their interviews. And until you see a good one of these, like Stripes, for example, you don't realize the difference between a good interview process and a, and a, something that people have just put together on the fly. I liked what you said earlier about, did you ever meet anyone from the team that you're you know interviewing with? Not every company did that because some of them, they don't do that whole team matching thing yet. Uh, and they wait to do that. So until you get to that team matching part, they may not even do that. And plus, it may turn out that the people on the team uh, are a level lower than you. And so they're not comfortable interviewing a staff plus engineer. Anyway, those are some of the a collection of the various rejections that I went through. Yeah, but I want to say that I, I had a lot of rejections as well. And some of them were really like super exhausting. And I, I remember two of them. So I interviewed for Google in 2015 and I interviewed as, a, as an engineer and I remember it was back to back the entire day, maybe six or seven interviews. And I, I was taking the subway back home and I was almost like vomiting on the, I was so exhausted that I, I, I got home, I went straight to bed and I like, it was so stressful that affected my emotional and I got dizzy, right? Like I, I could, I had just no energy left. It was so, so stressful. And the, the other rejection that I got was Bridgewater. You probably know this company and yeah, they're really aggressive. And I, <laughs> I remember being stuck on a all full, like white uh, room that had their cameras everywhere and they press record every time you have an interview. And those guys are really honest, like to the point where on the last interview of the day, they, they, the hiring manager, I don't know if they even have a hiring manager there. They asked me, oh, what, what do you think you did well? And I said, oh, I believe I, I said this thing. And the guy was like, no, it's all wrong. You have no idea what you're talking about. And it was really like to the point that I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know shit. Like I, I really, and I took the, the train back home, really sad. But I think the craziest story of all was like a time in Brazil that I interviewed for a company that if I had taken that position, I would have not come to New York a year later for the other company that I end up joining because I got, I got rejected from this startup that was in another state. So it's like, it's all those crazy random moves that happen. I think interviews are a part of the mix, right, Mitra? I think we've all faced so many rejections. I'm actually starting the interview process right now myself. And I was just saying earlier, I pulled up my old handy dandy sheet that I started in college during my first go at interviews. And you see the list of rejections and the very few offers that made it to the final stage. So I think it's normal. That's the first thing that I want everyone to take away is it's a numbers game, really. And at the end of the day, you have to figure out 
which one you choose. And every company has certain things they're looking for. So it's usually a timing thing and a situational thing if it doesn't work out. But one thing Vic mentioned, which is super important to remember is leverage. And so with it being a numbers game, you want to be interviewing at as many places as possible at the same time to make them all go faster. They'll all move at the speed of the speed you're at. So if you just have a few starting, they'll take their time. But if they know that you're having on-sites for three companies next week, they're going to speed it up and see what they can do for you. And ideally, at the end of the day, you have multiple offers and that you can, again, use as leverage. Louis? Yeah, I was just going to tell a funny story since Santiago jumped in with a fun story and, and Vic had a few of them. Okay, these interviews are brutal, but I once had, more, more than once, I've had to interview for CTO level roles and early stage startups. And there was one, and mo most of it, most of this sort of entails, most of this sort of entails going through several rounds, obviously, but usually you have to go through several rounds and you go through a panel, you have like a bunch of hyenas lined up, ready to chew you into pieces. Or I, I equate it to like a new lion trying to go into a new pride that they've never met. They're going to like try to tear you apart on the way in. And, and if they can kill you, they're going to kill you. And it's like the questions are like rapid fire. What would you do with this thing? And, and it was like, and, and one of them, I actually got through to the end and they made me an offer. And I wasn't actually ready. I had so much stock vesting at Walmart. I, I, I couldn't leave, but I went through that whole thing and I was so upset. I just wanted to see what the whole process would be like to get a CTO offer from one of these, you know, series A, series B startups. And I was proud that I made it all the way to that point, but I was like beaten. Like I felt like I had been chewed apart. Like it was like, I walked out there, they're like, oh, you're awesome. I'm like, you, you guys just killed me. Like, I don't want to work with you. Vic? I want to, okay, this, these are great. I wanted to add, add on to the thing that Mitra said, which added on to the thing I said about leverage. When I was interviewing with AWS, this process was taking so long, right? And I basically, every place that contacted me, I told them that I was interviewing with AWS, which helped me greatly because all none of these places wanted to compete with AWS and they didn't want me to get an AWS offer first. And this was before AWS doubled their base salary and all that. And so at every one of these places, everything from Google, which by the way, that's a whole funny thing. Google put me through to their final interview, but then they said, oh, but, it, but we can't schedule it for four more weeks. I was like, so you, okay, cool. You've moved me to the final step, but you can't even schedule it for four more weeks. But yeah, leverage is that whole thing. So you got to do that. And definitely, you know, when, when interviewers ask you, are you interviewing anywhere else? Tell them. Okay. That's one thing. Also, rejection is not a terminal step. I've been rejected so many times from so many places. And I know it's really hard in the moment. It's really hard to, to want something and not get it. And it's especially hard if you don't have a current job, which is why the best time to look for a job is when you already have one. If you think that you are not doing so great, interview somewhere else. And you don't even have to take the other job. You're just warming up your muscles in case you need to. And I currently work at a place that rejected me. So just because you get rejected does not mean you're burning those bridges and you can't apply there again anyway. Let's see, what else? There was a pretty fun interview that I failed. And so this is a good story because, so I interviewed with Fast, Fast.co, the company that just, just closed up shop after they burned through a whole bunch, millions and millions of dollars of investor money. Uh, for my screening interview with Fast, they had me write an LFU cache from scratch. That's a least frequently used cache. I said, okay. I misheard the question because they didn't write it down. So I misheard the question and I wrote an LRU cache, which is the least recently used cache. And they didn't correct me at all. So I wrote beautiful code. It, it was fantastic. It worked really well. I wrote test conditions and they just sat there and they just let me do this. And I went all the way to the end. And then they said, well, we actually asked for an LFU cache. And I was like, LFU, I'm out of here. I'm not going to do this. Anyway, that's an interview that I was happy to fail. Thank you, Rick, for sharing that. That's hilarious. So if you are a hiring manager or if you are anywhere on a panel and if you see an interviewee go off the rails, please correct them, work with them rope them back in because this is supposed to be a collaborative effort, right? You, un unless you work with the candidate, you'll never get the, the results you want. And same with the teams. Once they are on your team, you're not going to 
throw them in a dark hole and say, see you in a week after you have the solution, you'll be working with them. And the hope is that they'll collaborate, right? So that's ample opportunity to, to work with the candidate there. So please don't do that if this is you. Talking about leverage, so one of the advice I, I got from a, a mentor was whether you love your job or whether you hate your job, try and do at least two interviews a year. This will help you get the confidence. This will help you keep your resume up to date. This will help you prepare for the interviews. You'll also get to know what different companies look for in candidates at that level, how their process varies from you. If nothing else, it's something you can bring back to your own company and incorporate, right? Like the SLA is amazing, a two-week SLA or, or you're out. The only time I, I would say there is no rush in the interview process is if you're looking passively and there is absolutely no rush, you're just doing it to see how much you're worth and then let the process take three months. You, you don't care because you, you're happily chugging along till then. Keep in mind though, you might by the end of a four month long drawn process interview, you might be emotionally vested in the company because now you spend so much time preparing for the interviews going through each. And, and to Thiago's point, they can be stressful. They, each one requires prep and a different kind of prep. So by the end of four months, you might be like, oh crap, I'm, I'm perfectly happy where I am. I didn't intend to take this job, but maybe I should consider this. One of the questions I wanted to ask, since everyone here has been on a panel on both sides of it, should you interview for fit or should you interview for a particular role? So obviously there's pros and cons to both, right? If you interview for a role, a particular position, you know exactly what team they'll be leading, what sort of tech stack they have, what their domain is. So you can look for someone with that skill set or a parallel skill set that is easily transferable. Interviewing for fit is more generic, but then you end up spending a lot more time matching the person with the team. And that could be a long convoluted process. Depending on whether the interviewee has a say or not, they might end up in a team that they were not a big fit for. Because some orgs let you do the two-way ranking that Diego mentioned, but some orgs don't. They hire for fit and then they take it away and internally decide, okay, based on all the projects we have going on, based on all the vacancies that we have right now, we think this person would fit here. But till that person joins, they don't necessarily know what, what team or what project they'll be working on. So in your experience, what works well in interviewing for fit or a particular position within a company? One thing that I would say is as an interviewee, I had much better experience when I, I was interviewing for a seat that I knew exactly what kind of challenge. And I had that honest conversation with the hiring manager and they were pretty transparent. Okay, this is the situation. This is like the roadmap. This is like even some like personality conflicts we are seeing, like even some politics ahead of time. And then it's okay, if you go to the, to the interview process and you ask that role is yours, is that what you... And, and I have been on the other side of the coin where you do the entire interview, you put a lot of hours, a lot of energy, right? And then you get at the end and then you, you end up having to pick. The, and if you're trying to accelerate to finish it, and especially if you are unemployed, you might sometimes pick the, not exactly what you want, but the better off the tree or the better off the, the, the pitches that you receive as a candidate. So, but I, I would say for an engineer, right? I mean, is probably better because it's going to allow you to go end to end quicker if you don't try to do the match the, the seat at the beginning but i would say for for managers staff engineers it's really hard to try to find that at the end and you you already are really particular on the kind of challenge you want so if you then you ace the process and then you actually get at the end and it's another couple of weeks then they figure out okay, what is the scope that you can own as a staff engineer? Let's talk to different directors, whatever, or even as a senior manager, it's oh, like, where are the, the challenges that, or where are the, the groups that could have a manager like you? And then you, I don't know, you might be lucky and get two really great opportunities and you, you might pick the best you like, but a lot of times you, you get positions that are stuck for a long time that folks have not wanting that pitch or that particular hiring manager and you you have to, to pick one of those. Mitra? Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting question. It really depends on the situation, what you're evaluating, but 
a lot of times if you're not, if you're evaluating for fit, maybe not the role, I assume it's because you're not getting the seniority or level that you want. In those cases, I think even if you're especially clear with the hiring manager that your goal is to get to that level, maybe in six months or a year, it's not guaranteed and there is something stopping them from already leveling you there. So I would try to get as much clarity as possible on what that is. And if that's not something you can see really unblocking or moving, and you think that'll be a problem for you going forward, whether it's for resume sake, your career progression, whatever it is, then I think you should really consider that even if you love the company, you love the culture, because at the end of the day, you'll have promo cycles every six months and you don't want to be disappointed and you don't want to be feeling like you're going against a wall to get something that you feel like you deserve. On the other hand, if you just look at the role and you're just looking at the salary comp, but you're not really sure about the culture of the company or the team, I think that's a really, like maybe very few people can be okay long-term in a situation like that. I know personally, the team for me really matters, the people I work with, kind of work I do. And so even if the salary is a little lower, for example, I might be okay with that. So I think there's always compromises, but you'll have to make your own kind of pros and cons list for both and try to find a happy medium. And for the areas that you think are lacking, really see, is this something that you personally can change? If it's a culture problem, there's nothing you can really do, but if it's, you know, you're you need to work on two to three more projects where you're owning them end to end. That's definitely something that you could do. So you have to evaluate it that way. Here. That's great advice, Mitra. Yep. M money can't buy happiness. If the culture isn't a, a direct fit, then sure, you, you might hash it out for a few weeks, a few months, maybe a year or two, but you will get burned out. You will get to a point where you hate it and will want out. So definitely agree with that. So that's primary. That's still hard though, especially with big companies, right? Let's say you have Walmart or Google or Amazon or any of the big orgs where you end up, the culture isn't dominated by the company because these are 10,000 people or more. It's dominated by the team, your direct team that you work with and your manager, right? If your manager ends up being a micromanager who's on your case at all hours of the night, your life is going to be miserable, but you don't know that till you start the job. So it's catch 22. It's very hard to gauge that upfront. Vic, do you want to share first? I was actually just going to ask, isn't that the time when you would try to change teams and find a better role fit for yourself? If you're comfortable and you like the company culture, but you don't feel like you fit on a team, that really is the time to see if your company does any kind of internal mobility, and move to a different team, whether it's because of a culture thing or whether you just feel like the team you're in is actually a mismatch for your skill set. And this is, is a personal story at this point because I just asked for a team change. I love my team. I love my team. I love my manager. I love every single person I work with. And I actually like the work that we do, but I felt like a different team was a better fit for my skill set. And so, is, is that not a thing that you could do more of? I'll ask that as a question instead of stating that as an opinion. I, I definitely think you should, but in your limited interactions with the hiring manager, it's difficult to gauge that. Also in the past, I've heard from companies that say we strongly encourage horizontal movement within companies, uh, within different orgs in the company and we would go as much as recommending you to the other hiring manager. But I've found when they said that they were usually referring to junior and intermediate engineers because they have more transferable skill sets in certain time. But when somebody's become more experienced in a certain domain or an engineering manager, they prefer or strongly recommend that person stays on the team so that they don't lose all that business domain knowledge when they move with them. So. That's why I said it's harder to gauge that because obviously everybody is trying to sell you the best version of themselves to try and get you to come on board, but reality may not be the same once you join. Louis, do you want to share your thoughts? Yeah, so I've seen that transfer within teams work sort of two different ways. Some companies do interviews, just you're going to interview for a new company. And at that point, it's, hey, if I'm going to interview, might as well go interview. But so a lot of companies do that and, and purposely they want to put friction in between that process. They don't want it to be so easy, but it's a catch 22 for them because when they don't make it so easy, then 
they're triggering somebody to go interview at other places too. And then they might just lose them. So what, what I've found is the, the smaller the company, the faster moving, the startup, the, the more they hate when people transfer because things are so much now, they're moving so fast, they really need you. And so I would say that that's a big factor when moving. And then if it's a bigger company, a lot of times they don't care. It's just, it's part of business as usual that some folks will want to transfer. And they're usually very transparent about it, very open. But smaller startups, I think, struggle with this a little bit. And, and all the stuff that you said, Kier, basically goes into um, account. That's all I really wanted to add on the intercompany transfer. Thanks for sharing. So assuming you, you took all this fantastic advice from my co-host and you landed your job offer at your dream company, it's an awesome company. The culture is amazing. So you believe it's time that you got your package. So first question should you as an interviewee disclose your salary range or should you let the company come with their offer? What do you guys recommend? All right, I, I can't get started on that, but I just want to add on something that Vicky said before that remind me of a point that I missed before. I would say the, the fact that some companies actually have the team matching step at the very end, it might be a, like a super good point of leverage for you especially if you're not in a rush. And I think that example of a friend of mine, it took a year to, to decide to join a particular group at Google. He was actually, he knew the company culture and he was just like, okay, not the right opportunity. Let's wait. And, and I think because he had eliminated the pressure of the technical interview, it was a great opportunity. And the opposite would not be as easy, like to try to to have the, the, the matching at the beginning in either a big company or a small company because companies cannot wait that long. But if they have a big pool of candidates that like are coming and, and you have people that are sitting and saying, I, I don't like it, Tiago, let's I'm wait curious. for another one. Yeah. What was he doing for a whole year? <laughs> because I can't imagine just idling by for a whole year waiting yeah. for what, what he, he was crazy. on a mini retirement. He was pretty much enjoying his stuff and just waiting for the right opportunity to jump back. I think that was the, the truth of it. But I think it's, it's actually not bad at all for the candidate. And I said that it was bad because in my experience, I wanted to move fast and I, I, I wanted that match at the beginning because then I would put the energy and give my best during the process. But actually, there's nothing wrong with doing the team matching at the end with the caveat that you should not be in a hurry, right? You should not like trying to negotiate which offers because it's going to be really hard, especially if you're actually considering the, that company or if you're just not trying to get an offer to, to have as a leverage. But okay, going back to your point here. So should you say how much you're making and or what should you say instead? So I would say, of course, you should not say how much you're making, but I think there's a lot of material out there that the famous, okay, the really avoid that question or say things like, oh, I'm more interested in the role and I don't care much about salary and all that I think is bullshit. But I know folks really buy that idea of trying to deviate as much as possible from the to total comp that you want at the beginning. My advice is actually the opposite. My advice is do as much research as you can. Like we talk about the H1B visa. We talk about prevailing wages. We talk about talking to people. Do as much research and have as much data points as you can to then whenever the recruiter asks, you're, you're like asking the top of the range, but you're giving actual bands. You're not giving, oh, my salary is between 400 or my total company is between 400 and 700. Like, no, it needs to be like a, a range of a max of 25K. And that should be, or you can, but at least have the base salary that you expect based on research and have that up front. I feel, but Make sure that is like the top, I would say 85 percentile. And you can always negotiate at the end if you really like, if you have another offer on the table and if you really do well on the process. But I really don't like avoiding the question and, and putting and like putting a lot of burden in the recruiter. I feel that's not professional. You need numbers. You need to have some target. And if you don't have that, I think, like, come on, I, I don't like that idea that kind of, okay, I, I really don't care about salary. Even though I have taken that position in the past, I think that's a more mature view, my experience. But some, yeah. some recruiters won't let you proceed past that, right? They sure you can go back and forth 10 times, 
but eventually they'll say, give me a number or give me a range before I can put you through to the hiring manager or before I get your first interview. It forces you to do your research, but I think a lot of folks are not willing to actually go deep on the research and salaries. And I think that's where it's better to avoid if you have no clue what kind of salaries they're paying, right? Because then you might put yourself in a really bad situation. But I think if you can, I would say having the numbers and having a clear band of like how much you're looking for shows a lot of preparation. And then if the offer comes below that, you have, oh, we had that conversation. That's below my man. It's like, that's super clear. And if it comes above it and you have another offer, you, you can negotiate. You can always negotiate once you have an offer in your hands. And I would say at the end, that is like this advice that the, the rules like you should always come to offer, even if you had a number at the beginning and they, they match exactly that. But I think the counter offer should be 10%, but that's the, like the initial, but then you put another 10% that's based on a couple of other factors, right? Or if you did really well and you, you have another leverage and you can go all the way to 20% up on the counter offer. But if you, or you feel that you barely passed the interview and they are already really hesitant to, then you just counter for 10%, but you should always put that 10% and try to get that extra. Because getting an offer is not easy. And that might be an opportunity you had in three, five years to negotiate that. And usually it's going to be really hard for someone to pull away an offer that's ready on the table. Yeah. Th thank you, Tiago. I have a bunch of opinions on this too. This is really tough to navigate. I guess you're going through really tricky waters. Like you're about to sail through a hurricane. And for a number of reasons, but... I do think salary expectations, setting those up front is so important. I actually have seen people where they've gone through the entire interview and found out the salary was like half of what they expected. So they went through that pain for no reason. And they were so mad that they went through all that pain. And they, the actual interview was tough, right? Like they had to go through the whiteboard and all this other stuff. And so I think, number one, you've got to set the expectation. And again, you have a lot of power now as a candidate, especially in the U.S., here in the tri-state New York passed a law that you can't ask somebody what their salary is. It's illegal to ask them what their current salary is. You could ask them, what do you expect to be paid? But basically all of the states around New York have sort of done away with that. When I was a junior, I had this happen to me. I'm thinking back on it now. It, it gets me so mad. They actually forced me to produce pay stubs to prove that I was making a certain amount because the team that I was heading into, the company I was heading into had this policy that, hey, they don't pay over a certain amount from someone else. And, and you have to prove that's where you are for them to give it to you. And I'm so mad that I had to do that. And I hated them for it. But anyway, this is a long time ago. I've forgotten it until you guys all mentioned it. But but I, I think setting that expectation. But then you set the expectations, you go through the process, and then you get to the end and, and they make you an offer. This is very tricky now for a couple of reasons. You might end up, I know at Jet, we had fixed bands. Like we did not negotiate on People came in and they made a certain amount at a certain level. And if you got that level, you were going to get that much salary and it was fixed. There was no way to negotiate it. Like it was, and we were flat out honest about it, but it was very, it was at market, but it was competitive for the level you were coming in, but it was, and people would always try to negotiate and I would always end up on the other side of it, explaining why I can't, there's not literally nothing I can do and it's take it or leave it. And, and, and so, so you want to be careful how you do that, because obviously you're trying to go into this team now. And if you're fighting with the hiring manager before you even go in, it could be tough, especially if they're being fair. If they're not being fair, that's a whole different thing. If they're not being fair, I think you've got to fight like crazy. And so that's where it's tricky. But just like everyone says, once you have an offer in hand, you actually have a ton of leverage and you have leverage, not just in the place where you got the offer. You have leverage in the market now because now any other offer you could come up with, you could pit them against this offer. And that's really, that's really powerful. And I've seen people go to big tech companies and, and increase their salaries 40, 50% because they were pitting offers. They were pitting new offers, not even their current salary. And so I think that's a really powerful, powerful thing. Vic? I'm sure I'm going to end up repeating some of the things you said. Bulleted points I'll make here. Negotiate from a position of strength. Okay. And the time you're going to come in with your greatest strength is when you already have a job and you don't need their job. You are far more likely to make, have riskier asks and be okay with not getting that ask, right? Come prepared, use blind, use levels, figure out what this position is paying, figure out what the bands are for the position. And of course, ask the recruiter. Thing I don't like to take a call with a recruiter and go to the next step without ever knowing what the what this job is gonna pay. 
And so in that very first call, you have to ask, what is the pay range for this? Compensation is very important to me. And I would like to know what the pay for this role is before I proceed. I don't, in the interest of saving us both time, soften it up if you need to. In the interest of saving us both time, I would like to know what the compensation for this role is. And know that before you go. And they're not going to lie to you because that's a really bad look on them. And the other thing, what you're asking for from them in salary has nothing to do with what you make today. It is illegal in several states for them to ask you for your salary. However, they don't have to even ask you for your salary anymore. They can do a background check. And many of these places, basically, your salary information is for sale. They can find out what you make right now and what you've made the whole time. And so don't depend on your salary information being a secret and don't lie about it. So just say that you don't want to talk about it. That's totally a fair answer. The amount of money you're asking for has nothing to do with that. And leverage once again, saying that you're interviewing with a competitor is, is triggering a, scar a scarcity mentality in the person that you're talking to where they don't want you to go to a competitor. And there's a very good book on this, by the way, it's called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. It's about hostage negotiation tactics. And I think some of the things in that work really well for negotiating with your kid at bedtime as they do for salary negotiation. One of the tips that he talks about there is about anchoring your price. And I thought that, that was a really valuable thing where, you know, something like other companies in this role pay $600,000, something you start off with. And then like, it kind of anchors their expectation of what you're going to ask for and things like that. But I've talked a lot. Mitra. No, all amazing tips. I, I think a, f a few more that I kind of echoing a bit, but something I tweeted about a while ago is when you're reaching out to any company or any companies reaching out to you, just immediately upfront ask about the things you're concerned about or just want to know, which would be a deal breakers for you. So salary is one of them. Something else, maybe a certain benefit, like a commuter benefit or a maternity paternity leave. Another thing I always ask for is growth opportunities, because that's something that's really important to me and give a very strict timeline around that. So for me, for example, it's, I want to get to the next role in a year and a half or less. Is that definitely possible? Some places will say, ideally, yes. Like we hope that this grows into that might be like a red flag for you. So I think it's just really important to look at that in this day and age remote versus hybrid versus on-site is a really great thing to ask as well. If you really want to be only remote, you can really mark off a ton of companies. So just get your deal breakers out of the way. And then if they do ask for your salary range, always give a range. I think give a base salary range in my experience so that they can never just say, you said, you know, this number and we're giving you this number. You want to pad yourself and always give yourself more, say more than you think. Uh, it should be because you never know. And when it comes time to negotiate, you're going to be negotiating a lot more than just the base salary. You have stock options, you have bonuses. Some people negotiate, I don't know, vacation days. You can negotiate really the whole comp. Usually people just focus on the base salary to start. Always make sure you have that range in mind. I've had experiences hiring folks for a senior engineering role, for example. And I agree with Louis, there is a strict band, but people can fall all over the place in that band. And it's really because of negotiation. So you want to make sure that you're not selling yourself too short. So I saw for a senior engineer, when you're comparing at folks already at the company, they had come in with a number that was a lot lower than people currently had, but was still in the band range. So that was the offer. But then I was a hiring manager there, fought for some more like equality in that, but it's not always going to happen. So I think that's why, especially for women who we tend to put ourselves at a lower range, make sure you're always patting yourself. And if it ends up being a company that you really love and they just can't make it work, say, okay, you know what? I'm willing to be flexible. Let's see what we can do equity wise, for example. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for touching on that. Yeah, I was trying to, to get into specifics around, because I, I know we all gave concrete advice around negotiating and, and coming from a position of strength, which ones would you say are the most important to negotiate for, or, or do they depend from person to person and what position they are applying for? Is base salary the most important because then you, you get that recurring paycheck right away. Should you fight for a sign-on bonus if, if base salary is, is not where you want to be? Or stock options, if it's a company that you know is in in growth mode and in a year you will essentially double your stock 
again, g given how the tech stocks have been in the past year, that's not a guarantee anymore. And I saw some some people jumping ship just to get more stock options. They they were staying for the stock options that are vesting over three years. And now they are jumping to another company just so they can have more valuable stock options. And there are others too, right? Like vacation with unlimited paid time off that goes out the window, but vacation, commute, remote, or on-site or hybrid, a, a lot of factors come into play. What's the bare minimum that, that you should not compromise on, or is there one? So the answer to that, at least I have a hierarchy of what's the most important in the formula. I would say first base salary, then after I would say stock options, and then, and I can tell why, then signing bonus. And the last thing is, if it is a big tech, it's really hard, almost like impossible to negotiate vacations. You can have a lot of things like, oh, you agree with your manager, all that, but that's, is not in the books and probably never will be. So the reason why base salary first is because that is your fixed income, right? That's, that's what's going to count towards your, if you, if you decide to, to take a mortgage, right? It's not going to even consider your stock options because that varies a lot and can go to, to zero, it can go by half. As a lot of people have seen, I mean, at Uber, right? is going down here and you, like you're losing money staying there, right? The signing bonus, the one thing that I would say is, Yes, it's great to get that boost initially, but it's heavily taxed. So especially if you are in New York or in California, it's 40% plus go to taxes because it comes as a bonus. So is even though you're going to leave some in the table for the long term, if you can negotiate more equity you, and the company is growing or at least going sideways, you're probably going to be better tax-wise, I would say. But that depends case to case. And the other thing that not a lot of companies are going to mention, but some companies actually have the, the yearly bonus, right? In addition of the refreshers. And, and there are companies that don't have the yearly bonus in cash. So that might make also a difference, even though if you're joining as a smaller base salary, you get that boost. That is also heavily taxed, but it, it might help if you bundle that up. But I want to say two other things from Vic and Mitra that I, I felt really relevant to what I said before. I think. Vic is 100% right on, if you can get the recruiter to say the bands to start with, well, what kind of like total comp band are we talking about here? Like either on the first screen or, or via email, if, if they really are after you, you get a lot of leverage and you can say, okay, that makes sense or not. And they can provide some leverage, but not, not many companies are that transparent. And a lot of the companies, when they provide that kind of information, it's going to be only over the phone. And if you're lucky over... Uh, text message and recruiter. Actually, that's a funny thing. Like out of all the things after the offer, they would only reply back to me either via text message or phone calls. Emails would be ignored, right? You would never talk numbers in emails. It would be only text message or phone calls. And that's it. And I, I don't know why. I actually don't know why. And the other point that Mitra said is like the base salary is the, is the basic component of the formula. And Nothing matters as much as this, even though if it is a company that's duplicating every couple of years, it might not be a guarantee that they're going to be keeping going up, right? You might be lucky, but you're taking a lot of risk. If you, you take the old Amazon strategy, of, like you're taking more equity than base salary, and that might be good, but you might have a lot of trouble with mortgages or like other day-to-day -day things that are not ideal. Thank you. Those are some great pointers. So I, I think we have some great advice for one show. So we'll wrap it up here. So just to close it off, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. That's the Wayne Gretzky quote. So keep interviewing, keep negotiating. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye.